Uh, hi. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, good evening, depending where you are. Uh, I hope that uh, that you can hear me or hear us. Hi. Uh, oh, actually, good morning, maybe to some of you. We don't know exactly where you are in the world, but uh, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, global uh, public policy. And of course, some background information on the CISD, the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, and so on. So, thank you all for taking part in the webinar. Um, I'm actually joining CISD in five weeks. If you look for me on the web page, and I'm not there yet, um, that's why. And uh, I'm here with um, uh, Harold uh, uh, Harold Hewan. I uh, convene the uh, MSc in Global Energy and climate policy both on campus and online and I convene, co convene the degree, the MC degree in global public policy. Now the uh, global public policy degree online is an outgrowth of our work on campus where we've been teaching global public policy for uh, the last uh, eight years or so and uh, we've developed our work over those years and uh, uh, have turned it into a, a degree and uh, so I'm leading on this effort uh, together with uh, my colleague uh, Yanan and uh, Dr. Blush who is the Centre Director and uh, Mike do you want to say a brief word or two on, on your role? Well um, I'm going to be uh, I'm to be uh, co-convening actually the, uh, the, the MA program in global security strategy um, that's basically my role right now, but it will expand over the uh, course of the year. Um, we should probably uh, proceed with the uh, presentation. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to run through a, a few slides which explain a little bit about the program and uh, a little about, a bit about what it's like to study at SOAS. Uh, and then we'll have an opportunity at the end for uh, your questions. So, uh, we're going to run through a um, a, a few slides which explain a little bit about the program and a little bit about studying at SOAS. Uh, and then we have the opportunity at the end um, for, for any questions you have. And if there's anything um, that pops up, oh, okay, if there's anything that pops up while we're talking, uh, please feel, feel free to use the chat function um, that many of you are using right now, actually. Uh, and we'll be happy to, uh, to answer anything uh, that we don't cover uh, in the slides at, at the end. And we'll also have a Q&A session towards the end of our, our time here, uh, and hopefully we can answer these questions. If there's something more detailed that you need to know about that we can't answer in this time, I'll leave my email address or Harold will leave his and you can, uh, we can answer. Okay, so let's begin. Let's turn to, uh, to, to the first slide. Uh, what makes SOAS special? And, and we believe that uh, that SOAS is quite a quite a special place. Well, first, our uh, our regional expertise is uh, is uh, is in those for those places, Asia, Africa, and the near Middle East, where the the world is really important, where it's changing, um, and makes our uh, it, it deals with knowledge that's going to make our students competitive in the workplace now, but I think especially in the workplace in the coming decades. Uh, we're also priding ourselves in the work that we do with our students and the teaching quality, which has been ranked uh, very highly uh, over the last few years by our students in the National Student Survey, so we've been ranked first in London. And that's not just because uh, uh, of the way we engage with students, but also in terms of the size of our seminars, and you will find that in online as much as on campus, in terms of the numbers and the level of engagement that you receive as a student here. So we have like... Uh um, like I've been saying, a huge number of very experienced and dedicated um, staff who focus on these uh, on these areas, and we have uh, wonderful professional services that provide support um, for for the students and for us to allow us to offer the uh, the highest level of support um, that you can and you should expect um, that you need to study well, and um, you have access as well to uh, to fantastic library resources. We have uh, one of the one of only five national research libraries in the UK, uh, and that's a considerable asset. Um, we, we have uh, um, we have probably the I think we do actually have the best collection on Africa, Asia, and the Middle East in in Europe, probably in in, in, uh, in the UK and Europe. 
Finally, I should, should add to this that, of course, the, the library resources and the quality of the library are very important, but all the readings that you require for the course that you might do here with us at SOAS are provided for you online. So you'll have access to a very wide range of readings, either their journal articles or their digitized uh, monographs. And uh, that's something uh, that means that you have access to both the resources of the SOAS library as well as the resources of the University of London more broadly. Um, to add to that, we make a, a, a strong effort to make sure that the materials, the materials you need um, to, to, uh, to do your research, to study and so on, are, uh, are available online. Uh, that's becoming increasingly uh, easy in the UK as of open access policies, um, which uh, create incentives and often require academics um, to put at least one copy of the publication that's been funded by research um, up online for you to access freely. Um, in addition to that, as Harold mentioned, uh, we have a huge electronic libraries as well. So um, there all, may always be one or two materials um, that, uh, that you may need that you may not be able to find online, but we are able to, uh, to help you to find local resources to, uh, to compensate for that. The final word on SOAS, our student body is extremely diverse. Uh, very dedicated students from all around the world. So what you can expect as you would uh, uh, join uh, one of our courses, if that is indeed what you're going to do, is you would work with uh, uh, a cohort of uh, students from all around the world with professional backgrounds, with academic backgrounds, uh, various different age groups as well, which makes for a really exciting and uh, uh, um, um, a productive work environment for you. Anna Fay has asked the question, I'm gonna stop. So access to literature is then limited to soft copies, right? Um, no, the access isn't limited to soft copies, but we try to make uh, as much of what we need you to use uh, available to you in the easiest form possible. Um, so do you, can you speak more about any other? I mean, in terms of access to actual hard copy yeah. books, uh, you would have that access if you wanted to come and, and use the library, you could do so. It's entirely possible for you to do that in an actual physical way. Uh, but uh, a lot of our students, oops, that's, uh, we'll go back one, one. A lot of our students are physically unable to do so or do not choose to do so. So everything that you need and require for your work will be made available online. Uh, but you may also wish to, to have access to actual hard copies that's up to you. Okay, so um, speaking, speaking about uh, uh, students, we're going to go to the next slide, if I can. Okay, so so as numbers. Um, we have about 3,000 uh, online and distance learning students from, uh, from all over the world. Um, this is quite a large percentage of the students we have at SOAS. Um, we probably have, we've got 5,500 students on campus. Uh, sometimes that goes up to 6,000 or something. So about a third of our students at SOAS are actually online and, uh, and, and distance learning students. Um, so it's quite a large community, and, and online students are a big part of it. Um, but one of the good things is, we're, so we're not huge, um, but we, uh, we like to think of ourselves as, as having quite a big, uh, 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 big community. Um, but the good thing is that we're not too big and we're not too small. Um, we're small enough that uh, we can, we're very tightly knit, uh, and uh, our staff can be very highly focused um, uh, in their areas of specialization. Um, but we're big enough that we can cover um, the terrain adequately. Um, and uh, uh, we're big enough that we can offer the kind of expertise that you need to, uh, to, to further your studies. Yeah, and I would add to that that, of course, over the last few years, our online and distance offering has grown. So the number of students that are uh, working with us online um, has gotten bigger over time, and so has our shift or, or, or increasing focus on the online student cohort and the provision of administrative and support services for you, uh, which I think is uh, obviously a, a good thing. I think one of the, one of the best things about us speaking from my personal experience and, and how we deal with students is that um, we don't fit everybody, we don't force everyone to fit into a particular mode uh, of, of studying a particular sub-theme or sub-topic. And really, the uh, the kinds of theses that you write, it's really very bespoke. Um, and we devote a lot of time to supervision, both online and, and if you're on campus in person. Um, and students really enjoy, actually, the, uh, the especially the thesis part of, our, of, of 
right now. So that's, so that's one of the good things about being a smaller um, smaller university. Now, uh, we're also extremely diverse. So uh, our online students come from all over the world. We're, we're shading in the areas that, uh, that we cover here, um, Africa, Asia, uh, near Middle East, uh, well, that's you know, Middle East, North Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but a lot of our students come from Europe and uh, in America. Um, as I understand, we even had a student from Alaska. So um, our student, our online students are barely, barely well spread out across the world. Um, uh, like I said, a large, a fair number of students come from Europe. Large proportion come actually from Sub-Saharan Africa, and we have a fair amount from a uh, from other parts of the Americas, from the, the Middle East and North Africa and Asia. Um, so we have quite a mix um, uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, in a particular cohort, um, you're going to have colleagues that come from all over the world. And uh, this is one of the things that an online uh, degree does, is it opens you up to the rest of the world, to reality. Okay, coming to CISD. Um, uh, coming to the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, it's, it's quite a multi multidisciplinary center um, that we have here at SOAS, and it's not your, uh, your, uh, your usual department or center that focuses on a single discipline, because many of the issues that we face now, understanding the contemporary world, uh, understanding the contemporary world can't be dealt with simply through politics or economics or um, through historical analysis. It requires a multidisciplinary approach. And, and so we kind of emphasize that in our, in our programs. We draw faculty and researchers together who come from a variety of disciplines. Um, and uh, you may have uh, programs we, which you deal with people who come from economics, journalism, uh, myself, military history. So you could have people who come from military history like myself or diplomatic history like Simon Rolfe or, or Dan Plesch or, or, um, or your field. And this gives it a, this gives us an extremely, uh, 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 it makes CISD an extremely rich source of teaching and research. Um, and the, man, and uh, uh, the masters that we have available for you, um, you, can, uh, you can come to them from uh, 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 different approaches with different areas of interest in mind, Middle East, North Africa, South Asia. Um, and uh, uh, we can give you the kind of range and depth that you need to understand the issues that are, that are relevant to these programs. So that's, um, uh, oh, I see. Okay, so Anna Fay, since when and why did you decide to offer the MA Global Security and Strategy? And that's, um, we'll be coming to that slide um, later on, uh, but that's something that we're offering that's, that's new, actually. Um, the, uh, uh, one of the, one of the things, it came out partly because of my own interest in dealing with um, the Vietnam War and dealing with the uh, One Belt, One Road uh, for China going through uh, if I could pause for a second, my area of expertise is actually Myanmar and Bangladesh. Um, and so the, uh, the changes that are taking place in the Indian Ocean now uh, are of particular interest, interest to me. As a military historian, I've dealt with the emergence of armies and, uh, and military history and politics in Asia from the beginning of the 20th century until now. Um, and so I was actually interested in the shift in power from, well, after the Cold War, the shift in power uh, away actually from the United States and more to the world of great powers and and the place that uh, the role that China and India are going to play in the course of the of the upcoming century. So I thought it would be a great idea and, and other, I think other people have agreed um, if we looked at how countries like China and India uh, evolve their own grand strategies in the context of you know, America's still residual influence in, in large parts of the world, and it's very strong impact on the, uh, the, the Middle East in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. I should add to this that uh, CISD has had a 10-year-plus history of teaching international security as a module on campus, and in the last few years also as a very successful module online. So we have experience in teaching in this space, and our experts at the center, including the director, Dan Flesch, including Professor Mike Charney, who uh, is the other speaker here, obviously, as you guys know, uh, bring strong experience and background in security and strategic studies. So it's a natural outgrowth of the work we've been doing and the expertise that we have here to be offering such a master's degree. Now, uh, a few more words from me in terms of the available degrees. There's three degrees which we offer on campus, the main global 
diplomacy, for the MA in international studies and diplomacy, uh, uh, an MA in global um, um, uh, corporate uh, uh, policy, and, and an MSc in uh, global energy and climate policy. Now we offer these three also as online programs with its different strands. Uh, you can study it either as a diplomacy degree only, or you can study it with a focus on the Middle East and North Africa region, with a focus on South Asia, and soon to come with a focus on East Asia as well. Uh, we offer an MA in global security and strategy and global corporations, and of course, as I've mentioned before, global energy and climate policy. Public policy, just like the global security and strategy, is a new addition to our offering which we are starting this year. So uh, again, this is also an outgrowth of the work we've been doing for a, a long number of years and the expertise we've built over time. Uh, perhaps one more word on the MOOCs. MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course. So that's a course that you can do and participate in, usually in April, I believe it is, uh, of every year that is entirely free. You can go through a number of different uh, study sessions and learn about core topics in the four spaces that we offer our MOOCs in. At the end of it, you can uh, uh, get a certificate if you wish. That's, that comes at a small additional cost, but you don't need to get that necessarily. And we offer MOOCs in diplomacy, in research methods, in the United Nations, and in energy and climate policy by way of helping to prepare you for some of the work that you might be doing as part of a master's degree. Uh, with us at uh, at uh, CISD. So um, we're going to turn to uh, how this all works. So um, so in terms of how it works, how does studying online work? Um, and we have a lot of students actually who are uh, who have been curious about this, who are curious about this, and uh, uh, so most of us have been through campus experiences. Um, and sometimes, uh, it, um, because of our our backgrounds and campus experiences. We're a little bit uh, uncertain about what an online experience is and uh, how that would translate, um, how that would change the kind of uh, learning experience you have. Um, and what we can say is that the from experience, but uh, what we what generally seems to be case, the case from ex experience here is that uh, uh, the teaching experience translates online. Uh, it's a very it's very rewarding. Uh, we get a lot of feedback, uh, we talk to our peers, and when we talk to students uh, in the virtual learning environment, um, we get feedback from them. Uh, there's a lot of energy, the energy is high, and um, uh, students are very positive about the program. It's got a very high approval rate. I forget which year, but it's uh, recently, right? 95% uh, approval rate from students. Uh, and actually, in terms of uh, the, uh, the degrees awarded, our students actually do, I forget how much percentage better than on, on-campus students, uh, and that indicates the quality of the uh, of the offering. It's part of this that uh, it's yes, the student feedback, of course, on the modules we offer, but our retention rates are very high, of 90 plus percent, which uh, compared to the rest of the sector is a very high retention rate. Retention rate means students start a degree, come onto courses, and decide to actually finish it, rather than say, okay, maybe halfway through. Uh, that uh, it's all too tough or too difficult or not really tailored to my needs. So we're trying to tailor to your needs as best we can. And, uh, and we're quite happy, I should say, that we've been successful in, in that regard. I think the, the most important ingredient here is flexibility. So uh, uh, it allows the, the way that uh, uh, distance learning operates, allows us to, to, uh, to deal with you more individually than we might have to if we had group campus sessions. Uh, it allows you to be flexible in meeting the requirements for your course so that if you have uh, personal obstacles that emerge, you know, a family crisis or you're sick or something like that, uh, you know, there can be bespoke restructuring or uh, adjustment. Um, a question that we often get in terms of how it works, uh, perhaps not so much the actual process, but the comparison, which Mike mentioned between the on-campus and the online, is that the readings that you engage with uh, the materials, the topics that you cover, there is no appreciable difference between on campus and online. You cover the same materials, you grapple with the same critical questions, you, uh, you're tasked with uh, activities, we come to that later, in terms of explaining how that works, and the degree that you receive at the end of it is the exact same degree and the exact same quality of degree that you receive on campus. Um, 
the uh, Maurizio, I'm going to pause for a second, because Maurizio asked the question, for the distance learning courses, are there any mandatory lectures that require you being present in London? Uh, no, uh, is the answer. You do not need to be present in London as part of your uh, degree. That's the, the purpose of the online training, is that everything is provided online. Uh, you are able to, if you, if you are in London, to attend special seminars that we offer. Uh, we're also offering you the uh, possibility to partake in our study tour. You're also, of course, very much welcome uh, to be part of the graduation ceremonies on campus. You're also welcome to use uh, the library resources on campus if you, if you wish, but there are no mandatory on-campus lectures that you need to attend. So you do the activities. I, I, can say a, I can say a quick word on that, the activities in terms of how it works per, per unit. What you do is you do four courses as part of your degree, one after the other. At the end of each of these modules, you do a small research module to help prepare you for your dissertation work, the research that you do for the dissertation, the writing that you do for the actual dissertation. Mike mentioned this earlier as something that our students think is very rewarding because it brings together uh, the work that you've done over the course of the two years and, uh, and really gives you the chance to develop your field of interest as a significant piece of research. So you do these four modules that takes you almost up to two years. At the end of those four modules, you then engage in your dissertation module, which is module number five, and that completes your study with us. And after two years, you've completed your work on the degree, uh, assuming that you've gone through this successfully. Now, the activities in a way that for each of the four modules that you undertake, you will be tasked with six different exercises, starting with a small exercise to familiarize yourself with the content of the course and with the research work you required, going up to much bigger exercises, text critiques, for example, on which you receive feedback from your cohort, as well as us as uh, course conveners and your associate tutors primarily. It will go all the way up to writing a larger essay uh, for which you will be prepared as part of these activities. You receive feedback on each of the six activities and it builds up your ability, your knowledge, your understanding in the space of this module and the topics that it covers. And the essay, of course, is a marked piece of work. And when that is completed successfully, you can move on to the next module and then work your way through the degree. We should add that, um, that in terms of support, uh, you'll have a dedicated associate tutor, you'll have a personal tutor, you have the program director or the for the program, uh, and you have a dedicated administrator, and all of these people are devoted to making sure that the program works for you and that you're a success in your studies. So it's it, it actually the support I think is probably even better per person than you might find on campus in a larger program. So let's turn to um, did we cover online course materials? Yeah, I think we probably if you have questions about that, please uh, please let us know. I'm going to turn to uh, the program structure. It's laid out very clearly here. Um, in terms of the structure, each of the MA programs has four 30 credit uh, modules, and then uh, equally um, there is a 60 credit dissertation module, and that adds, uh, adds up to 180 credits, and that's what you need to get a master's degree. Um, there are two, oh, um, and I forgot to mention, did we mention the study sessions here or later? The study trips? Okay, so um, we'll come back to it if you have questions there. Oh, I see. Um, Michael, the diversity, um, so we have a question from Anna Fay. Uh, Michael, uh, the diversity among students you were referring to earlier, does that also apply to the professors and lecturers? Um, yeah, uh, fairly. Uh, okay, so I, I, what, what, what degree do I want to? I can, I can, I can say that. To an extent, so we have a pretty diverse body of, of people you'd be working with depending on the module that you would be engaged in. So we have uh, lecturers, course conveners, associate tutors from all around the world, and uh, of course, they're not all men here. We also have uh, women lecturers and associate tutors, so you will be in quite diverse hands. For example, the associate tutors working on uh, the uh, global public policy. And the convener for the global public policy and recently is Pino Panapati uh, Pillai uh, and uh, is now Fea Lesniewska, uh, who bring their own expertise, their own knowledge. Yan Ansong, who is the co convener of 
the of the uh, degree with me uh, so we have a pretty good uh, gender spread and we have a pretty good spread uh, in terms of the uh, backgrounds from around the world and also what each of the conveners and associate tutors brings to the table in terms of their own expertise so for example mike uh, has a very strong expertise in security and strategic skills uh, and he brings that in but some of the people that you'd be working with on other modules come from some of the backgrounds you've mentioned before we have uh, uh, as you see in terms of the elective modules that are possible for you to take as part of the course uh, a variety of different people you would be working with uh, that's not just uh, a bunch of uh, white blokes um, so we had another question from Anika. Um, the modules say they are subjective, uh, subject to availability. How many of the electives tend to run each section, each session, and how likely is it that the module we are interested in will be running each, uh, each session? Um, how many of these electives run each session? So the majority of the electives run each session. Uh, sometimes when they're smaller, more niche topics, it might be more difficult to get them to run every single time. Uh, the uh, thing to do here would be that you might not be able to do it in the session you want to do it, but you might be able to do it the year after. So we will always try to ensure that during the course of your study, which is the two-year length of the program, you would be able to take an elective that you're interested in, and the majority of them will run uh, 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 in each session, but some of them, so I can give one example, because I also convene the Global Energy and Climate Policy uh, Masters, we have an elective in uh, uh, finance, sustainability, and climate change, which is quite focused on sustainable finance. That does not run every single session, but it runs every other session. So there's always an opportunity to take the module. It might not be in the slot that you had envisioned, but you would be able to do it at a later stage. So we had another question. I'm going to, from Tom, and before I answer your question, Tom, I'm first going to say that um, as we have on the bottom of the screen, the FE for um, level for 2019-20 is 12,000 pounds total, or 3,000 pounds per 30 credit module. And that allows you to pay in installments, um, which a lot of students find very helpful. Now, Tom's question is, if you're paying per module, does it cost more? Or do you only pay for the 430 credit modules and not the 60 credit dissertation module? I believe it doesn't cost more. Uh, it's still the same. And that's one of the great things about installment payments. The thing to remember here is that if you only pay for individual modules, only do the modules, the four modules, but not the dissertation module, you do not end your studies with an actual degree in hand. So you can, of course, do that. You can get an exit award after doing two modules. You can get an exit award like a, a, a postgraduate diploma after four modules, but you do not get the full master's. And of course, it should be in your interest to complete your studies with a master's degree. And that's the difference between doing individual modules or paying the whole lot and going through the dissertation module as well and pushing yourself to undertake your own independent research and making a real contribution to the field. I think um, partly, if I'm reading the question correctly, he's saying um, there's no additional fee for taking this through the 60 credit dissipation uh, if, if they paid for the 430 credit models. Effectively, it's incorporated because after every module, as I said earlier, after every uh, session that you do, you have a res small research module tacked on as part of it, there's four in total, and they then lead directly into the final dissertation. So it's basically inbuilt into those four modules and the process that you undertake that you then also write your dissertation. So there's no additional uh, 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 rate that we charge for this, um, for this, for these steps. We have another question from Andy Platt. At what stage of the course are you required to decide on the dissertation topic? We have, as part of our uh, small research modules and dissertation modules, some early work that we want you to do to prepare an outline, to prepare a draft for a research idea and for a dissertation topic. So uh, within the first year, we will want you to think about the topic and to, to develop a, a research design, if you will, into this topic, which you will then use at a later stage to write the actual dissertation. 
Now, we understand very well that sometimes these ideas change and that the material availability of, you know, the, the readings and uh, maybe the, the, the people you'd like to talk to as part of the qualitative research or interviews might not be available, etc., etc. So sometimes topics change. But we want you to also start thinking about topics fairly early on and nailing them down fairly early on because that helps you in your research and that enables you and gives you time to do the actual research work uh, in the second year and towards the end of the second year. So um, we're going to turn to the um, to the next slide. Uh, so this is mine. So this is the this is one of the this is the new program. So um, the MA Global Security and Strategy Program. It's a it's a new interdisciplinary program, and we attempt to examine the major security challenges to different actors in the changing global climate, and how some states are revising and evolving their grand strategies in order to uh, meet them. We're going to take a critical approach to the traditional way in which uh, studies has been covered. Um, those that focus on the West, the global North, and look more closely at Asian, African, and Middle Eastern approaches to grand strategy for security and peace, um, international collaboration, resolution of conflicts, um, acquiring war technologies, building up armed forces, uh, uh, climate change, and, uh, and, and, and the like. Um, but we also approach a range of questions peculiar to the 21st century. So how do we understand, for example, the shift from, uh, you know, like a lot of the very high positive expectations that came up when, you know, the Berlin Wall came down, uh, Fukuyama's end of history and, you know, end of the Cold War and the security challenges um, that are now uh, challenging a lot of the global security uh, architecture um, just a few decades later. You know how do we um, how do we deal with uh, with the uh, with the, the tensions that are emerging between you know the expansion of uh, human the mass expansion of human demography, um, extreme and very rapid climate change, um, and, and industrialization, which are all interrelated. Uh, how do we reconcile that with countries that only think short term in terms of state power? Um, how do we how do we negotiate those uh, the, the challenge and the uh, um, the, the, the attraction to, uh, to ignore what's happening. How do states evolve mechanisms that can help the, the world deal with, uh, meet the promises from the UN on global climate change, sustainable development, and And we've also reached a point now where the science fiction of the past is no longer fiction. So how is new technology, particularly artificial intelligence, going to impact the nature of conflict? And, and how does that raise new questions about ethics? And, and this kind of thing in war. Um, students will get a, a, a grounding of the subject and understanding of the concepts around global security and strategy, uh, particularly from, uh, from a non-Western viewpoint, and they'll be able to apply, um, apply this um, uh, to the areas of business and commercial risk assessment, um, the NGO sector, um, and maybe in military or foreign uh, uh, government service. Um, you'll get a, a, a sophisticated critical understanding of global policy, uh, governance developments, and I think especially the history that, that lays, lies beyond this, and also the, uh, the, the future trajectories where things are, uh, things are very are, are headed. So uh, the degree builds on our campus teaching, which appeals to people um, uh, uh, developing careers in global security and, and business and uh, government service and uh, UK service and foreign service. Um, and those people who are working for commercial risk assessment firms or, or, or NGOs. Um, and to take one, I, I wonder, I was going to take one module and look at it in closely, the international security studies. Um, but actually, we're, we're already at 37 minutes. So maybe uh, I'll come back to that later if I need to. Let's, skip, let's go to your, your class next. Oh, wait a second. Okay, so I have a question. Guy Yeoman, there appears to be no specific China-centered module. Given the country's significance, this seems to uh, uh, be a gap. Are there plans to introduce one? And yes, there, I have plans to, uh, to introduce one. I should point out that that's one of my, that's one of my main areas of, uh, of interest um, because Myanmar is right on the, uh, right on the initial step of the, of the One Belt, One Road. Uh, and so actually I deal with China quite a lot and, I, and, and joining CSD, one of the things I want to do is introduce a, a, a very focused um, uh, China in the 21st century. Now, uh, Anika, the list of electives here are different to the ones on the uh, website, which are accurate. For example, there is one on the website. I'm interested in not in this list and vice versa. But perhaps you can answer that because that's, uh, 
that's not uh, so that's a very good point in terms of the list of electives the uh, this is an incomplete list of electives here uh, perhaps also due to the fact that there's a bit of uh, uh, space constraint on the slide i will have to say the same thing about uh, the upcoming slide on uh, might, might as well go there the upcoming slide on public policy which looks emptier that's uh, an oversight, uh, the list of electives is uh, considerably longer than, than here. So what I would encourage all of you to do is to actually look online at the list of electives uh, for our programs, and there you will see a much more comprehensive list for uh, each of these, uh, these two, or both of these two programs. Um, the, the point that uh, Mike made, on, on China is very well uh, taken. Um, I should add, however, that as a Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, we have historically not developed uh, modules on individual countries. We address very much cross-cutting issues, uh, international economics, international security, uh, uh, energy policy and climate policy, without focusing necessarily only on one specific country. Now, China has a very a uh, uh, special role that it plays and is very big and important so Mike's module is very much welcome but uh, uh, other than that we have modules that focus more on regions so the global diplomacy MENA, uh, South Asia and the upcoming East Asia will address a number of country dynamics within those regions as opposed to only individual countries. Um, a quick word on the MSc in uh, global public policy, oh, sorry yeah I got on the, the last point. Yes, uh, uh, for, for dealing with China, there's no way that you could actually deal with China without dealing with the region. So it will be a regional, uh, nationally trans-regional course. Um, but let's let's move on to the uh, MSc. Yes. Um, so this is a, a, a degree I co-convene with uh, Dr. Yan and Song, uh, and I have been teaching global public policy on campus for the last uh, seven years. Uh, it's basically a a program and the core module is public policy which uh, teaches a core set of skills that are required of policy professionals in the public private and not-for-profit sectors at both international and national levels so whether you're aiming to be a policy analyst or to work as a policy maker or you're already working as a policy maker what you would need to do is identify policy problems You'd need to formulate, evaluate, and recommend possible solutions, and you might be involved in the implementation of these policies as well. So what the module does is it covers key concepts, key theories, and the program more generally as well, key concepts, theories, that will enable you to undertake a critical analysis uh, and of a given policy space. So it can be in health policy, it can be in climate and energy policy, it can be in uh, 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 public uh, safety and security it can be in education, it can be a range of different uh, policy areas, and it helps you to understand the very complex and often very messy process and fractious process by which this policy is actually formulated, um, then adopted, and then implemented. So, what we're trying to do here is not look at policy in the way of just looking at the outcome of the policy processes, i.e. policy papers, laws and regulation and its implementation, but actually to look into the engine room and to understand the processes by which outcomes are produced. The mechanics of it, indeed. Um, so the module public policy and the program, MSC and Global Public Policy, adopts an approach that treats policy as the outcome of politics and an analysis of policy as inseparable from an analysis also of political dimension. So of course what we need to look at is we look at uh, changing power dimensions. We look at the role of race, class and gender in shifting, uh, 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 determining uh, policy outcomes. We look at a clash of different ideological traditions that have an impact on the choice of policy tool that you might uh, uh, wish to, to take uh, going forward. And that is something that cuts across a number of different country and regional dimensions. The study of public policy theoretically uh, has uh, historically been very much a US uh, informed, informed one. And so of course the choice of case studies has been very much US focused or Western focused. 
but we are taking a much more global approach that draws on examples and cases from around the world and looks at uh, traditions, historical, theoretical traditions and practical examples from uh, around the world. Uh, I think that, that, that rounds out my, my, my uh, comments on the MSC in global public policy. And we can turn to Maurizio's uh, question real quick. Tell me, uh, roughly, how many hours do we have to count in per week um, for the masters? I mean, it depends uh, how many hours per week. It depends on, uh, for example, which course it is, what your reading load is, how quickly you read and understand material. Some people feel the need to read through uh, uh, um, a required reading two or three times to fully get the you know, the core of it and to take notes. Others perhaps only need to read it once or twice. So of course there's a difference in this. It will also change from week to week depending on whether or not you have an essay due, whether or not you have an activity due. If uh, uh, it's two weeks or one week to your essay deadline, you may take a few more hours each week to write than, than uh, you would in a normal hour. So say for example, uh, in a normal week, uh, you might spend anything between uh, while well, you have the online stuff between five, six hours, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more, depending on the reading that you undertake. In a week where you write your essays, you would spend considerably more time than that. So you might find that the, the topic of that week is, week is not your top interest, but another week, maybe that's the main thing you're interested in, and you'll spend a lot more time on that particular topic. Um, so your interest can also be another factor in how much time you spend that week. But of course, if you're having fun, it's going to go by very quickly. What I would say is that for the day, uh, say if you compare it to on campus, on campus you might have uh, three or four units that you do in the week. Um, but then, of course, on campus is only concentrated within one year, not two years. Um, for each module that you take, you might want to set aside a half day uh, or a little bit more for the readings, for the actual time that you spend in class, and the time that you spend engaged with your associate tutor and the other people on the course. So it's very similar online. For the module that you do, you take your day or your half day to do the readings, to prepare for the, the module, to engage online with your cohort and with the associate tutor, uh, and then maybe afterwards to do a little bit more reading because you've developed an interest around a particular topic or you want to follow up on something and clarify. So the five, six hours can be an estimate. It can be a bit more, um, but not significantly less because you have reading and work to do. So um, we're going to move on from my, from the MSC Global Policy to, um, in part because of time, um, we're going to move on to, did I miss the applications page? Okay, uh, well, should we, okay, let's do the applications page here. Um, and I'll go back to the study tour. Um, the, uh, uh, we got the, the, the application uh, process laid out here fairly quickly. Um, some of you have probably already been through this already by now. Um, it's very straightforward. It's submitted online through the departmental website. Uh, we, we have a, we, we're, uh, the CISD gets through the applications very quickly to give you a sense of uh, what your position is because that'll allow you to uh, get started with your studies. Um, it, it, usually the case that you're notified within 10 days of your application of a conditional offer and of course a conditional offer is it means that uh, that we need some proof or something other other information that's required um, before we can go on to the offer being unconditional. Um, supporting documentation uh, of course could include maybe a passport or national identity card, proof of English language uh, uh, proficiency uh, if it's required. Uh, certain uh, uh, transcripts may have to be translated to be accepted by the university. Uh, and you might be, in some cases, you might be asked for references uh, that can often happen to take a, uh, that can take a while if you've, if you've been out of academia for quite a long time and, and uh, out of contact with the people you need to, to write those. So it just depends on the individual, um, and that's why there's some flexibility here. Uh, once these things are provided, the offer moves on to unconditional, and your entry requirements uh, is, a, uh, is a minimum first degree with good grades in any subject, which is equivalent to a UK second class, upper second class, of course, and, and for this uh, particular program, uh, 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 programs uh, for the CISD, uh, you may, it may be the case that for some of these programs, uh, 
instead of academic qualifications, you know, we, you need to consider your professional qualifications or your experience. Yes, generally uh, what we have done uh, at CISD, and I think that's a bit different at the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy than it is in other uh, departments, and so as in other universities, is that we value a professional experience as well. If you have worked in the space for a very long time, and maybe your first degree isn't that strong, but you bring 15, 20 years of experience somewhere, or 10 years, uh, we will look at your application in the round. Uh, there may be things in there that strengthen your overall application, even if not done so well in your first degree. Maybe your first degree wasn't the kind of field or topic that you should have chosen and you haven't done so well, but actually you really know your stuff and you know you should be on this degree. So that's why we'll look at this. We'll look at your personal statement. We'll look at the references. We'll look at the things that you supply to us. Uh, uh, in the round, and I think that can make a difference. So even if it's not a first or it's not a, a two-one, sometimes uh, we do make these exceptions because we understand that people come from various different backgrounds and experiences, and they bring strengths uh, that uh, um, that need to be given a chance sometimes. Well, we have a couple of questions uh, in this. In the first question is whether somebody with experience, professional experience, and a master's degree at ANU, but no undergraduate. Degree. That's something we would have to talk. We would have to talk about, um, but that's that's a possibility. Um, another person asks, well, they're currently working on their BA thesis. They'll submit in August. Um, can I still apply for the masters? Um, yes, that's that's also something you can do, and, and, and we can talk to you about that. We accept applications uh, throughout the year, so we have a rolling uh, applications process. Some departments will cut off in June or July, for example, or even earlier than that. That's not the case at CISD. We will accept applications all the way through. The only thing for you to keep in mind is that if you leave it too late to the start of the academic year, which online courses in October, there's a problem with uh, being able to process your application quickly enough from an administrative perspective. So you want to avoid that. But if it is in August, if it is in July, August, or even early September, you would still be able to get your application in. We operate quite quickly in terms of turning around your applications. So uh, um, I think that's not an issue. And from my experience, because I'm also admissions tutor for two different programs, i.e. I'm the one looking at all your applications, uh, this should be possible. Okay, so um, that's the, the program so far, except for one element, the study tour. Um, and we have study tours that go to, uh, to several different places. Uh, New York, Washington, uh, Ethiopia, uh, and also Geneva, right? And where else? Uh, so to Brussels and Paris. Okay. Okay. So um, one of the things, one of the aspects of this online program is that it provides uh, provides you with the opportunity to go for the CISD study tour um, if you choose. And, and this happens in June, which is probably the best time to visit um, Europe. Uh, but apart from that, uh, you'll also visit some extremely relevant international organizations. Uh, you have a list right here of some of them. The World, Health Tra World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Office for, to, uh, and so on and so on, so on, ILO. Um, and they, it's not just limited to these. Um, so, uh, so students, you would normally go for these study tours in conjunction with students who are also studying this, uh, on uh, same things on campus. Uh, so it's a very good mix, and it's an opportunity to know your actual cohort in person instead of just through uh, online. Um, know the ones who are on campus as well as others who are studying with you online. Uh, and uh, you go and you visit these organizations, representatives who give you a background of where they're coming from, uh, the kind of work that the organization is doing. Um, it, it's not... It, uh, maybe, have you been on one of these? You, can you come on your personal experience? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give my personal experience. I've been um, leading the Energy and Climate Policy Study Tour for the last uh, seven years to Brussels and Paris, where I take my students to meet with the European Commission, with the International Energy Agency in Paris, with a number of lobby groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The idea is that you put into practice the things that you would have talked through in a more theoretical way, uh, uh, throughout the degree and throughout the, the modules that you've studied and engage with decision makers, key policy makers in uh, the relevant spaces. Now, uh, there are a number of study tours, as Michael has already said, not just the one that I lead, 
uh, we have the one to New York and Washington is one, and the one to Addis in Ethiopia is one. Those happen in April. And then we have the other study tours, i.e. the one I lead and the one that is the corporation's one, which happen in uh, June, as Michael has already said. Um, and it's possible for you to come uh, onto these, uh, especially for you uh, in terms of the security and strategy as well as the global public policy ones, the ones to New York and Washington and uh, Addis and perhaps the ones to Geneva might be the most interesting in terms of the organizations because the study tool that I lead to Brussels and Paris is very much focused on energy and climate policy, which might not be everyone in cup of tea. Um, so uh, it is a full week and it is a week in which you will do quite a lot of things, quite a lot of meeting with experts and practitioners who will talk you through the things they do on a daily basis and who will engage with you to help you understand uh, how uh, a lot of the things you've worked through happen in practice. And of course, it's also a team building, uh, a team building exercise. Um, that's a really neat thing to do at the end of your studies and caps this off quite nicely. And if you have more detailed questions or more personal questions, um, anything you want to ask uh, outside of this talk, because we'll be finishing up in a couple minutes, uh, send us an email and we will get back to you. Uh, uh, you know, tonight or, or depending on the, on the length of the question. Uh, now I see Anna Faye is uh, typing, typing another question. I will move to the last slide before while well, well, that's being done. Uh, yeah, it's a question slide. So we're, we're going to stop here because we're out of slides. Uh, um, if you have any questions or queries, uh, we're more than happy to address them here in a few minutes. And if there's anything else or any other things that come up to you, uh, any thoughts that come up to you later on, uh, please feel free to write us at one of these two email addresses. Okay, um, oh, can you clarify are, from Dai, are the final degrees from the University of London or SOAS? Uh, they're, from, they're from SOAS, University of London. Yes, so uh, maybe we don't have the time to go into the history, uh, but the way that SOAS would uh, uh, style itself in terms of its degrees and in terms of its official name is as SOAS, University of London. So we carry in our official title, not just the word SOAS or the term, the term SOAS, but also that we are part of the University of London. So the degree is from SOAS, University of London. I, I, I should comment that in the past when these presentations have been done, I think questions were saved from the very end, but actually I think it was much more effective to actually answer these throughout. All right, guys, thank okay. you so much. Uh, thank you very much. We will field any and all other questions as they arise by email. And uh, yeah, we're there for you, so feel free to just let us know. Thank you.